Well, good afternoon and happy Columbus Day to everyone viewing. I'm President William Fahey, the president of Thomas More College of Liberal Arts here in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Also the president of the college's Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture, which is sponsoring this afternoon's conference on Columbus, Rediscovering Columbus, a new adventure in the age of cultural obliteration. The Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture was established three years ago by the college in order to provide a very robust witness in the public square to the Christian contribution to our civilization and our nation. And so I think most people can see today's conference as um, an obvious pick for something that we would want to support and advance. Yesterday, uh, about an hour to my south in Boston on the Boston Common, there was a very large protest, one of several that have been occurring since the summer. And this protest was a protest of various movements calling for the abolition of Columbus Day and the complete removal throughout the state of all signs of Christopher Columbus, all signs of the Western and Christian heritage um, entirely. And of course, this is not a unique phenomenon in the United States today. We've had a long summer where over three dozen monuments have been defaced and removed. One of the first was the statue of Christopher Columbus in Boston, which was decapitated. This may explain some of the care and poignancy of the president's address that he gave on Saturday. It is and has been the privilege of American presidents for some years to issue a proclamation reminding the nation that the 12th of October is Columbus Day. And President Trump did issue a rather elegant proclamation, which I um, draw your attention to, in which he calls for Americans to remember the significance of the day and ask for them, ask for them to resist radical ideologies that are attempting to revise history, deprive history of its splendor, mark it as inherently sinister. Now the situation is very strange that Columbus should be a target of attack if we go back just a little bit earlier in history. If we go back to the 400th anniversary of Columbus coming to and discovering the new world, you had an interesting occurrence in 1892. And that was an encyclical issued by the Catholic Church under Leo XIII, which called for all the bishops and archbishops of Spain, Italy, and all the countries of North and South America to offer masses on or near the 12th of October to the Holy Trinity. And I just want to read one little section where Leo XIII explains why he's issuing an encyclical to someone that he is not arguing should be canonized. And he says there that the day needs to be commemorated for two reasons, for the exploit in itself and for the man. And Leo XIII said, it should be commemorated for the exploit in itself for it is the highest and grandest which any age has ever seen accomplished by man. And it should be celebrated to remember the man who achieved it for the greatness of his mind and heart, which can be compared to but few in the entire history of humanity. A few months after that encyclical was issued, President Benjamin Harrison of the United States declared that Columbus Day was a national day of celebration. It would take a few more decades for it to be observed in every state. Um, and it would be during the Great Depression that it was turned into a federal holiday. But all these early leaders who celebrated the day understood the day as bringing people together. And it is tragic that it has become a day to revise our history and separate us. So I'm very honored to introduce our speakers and that my college is hosting this conference. Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Robert Royal. Now, Dr. Royal is 
our first visiting chair in Catholic studies, the St. John Henry Newman Chair in Catholic Studies, which has just been established here at Thomas More College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Royal, many of you know, he holds a PhD from Brown. He's written on a wide variety of books, ranging from the Swiss Guard to the spirituality of Dante. I would imagine many of the viewers this afternoon are readers of The Catholic Thing or know Dr. Royal's good work when he was um, at the American Enterprise Institute and the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC, where he still continues his work. Dr. Royal will be speaking today uh, on themes related to his most recent publication, Columbus and the Crisis of the West, a book published by one of our co-sponsors, Sophia Institute Press. So without further ado, we'll move to our first talk, Dr. Robert Royal. Okay, I'm sorry for that. We're, uh, we're working out the, uh, the tech side of this. Let me say again, I wanna thank William Fahey for everything he did to help set this up and for the wonderful things he's doing here at Thomas More College. And he rightly started us off with this um, reflection on a century or so ago. So at the 400th anniversary of Columbus, uh, Columbus's landfall in the Americas, he was highly celebrated both by the Protestant and progressive establishments in America, no less than the newly arrived members um, of uh, the newly arrived numbers of Catholic immigrants, Italian, Irish, and Slavic. America and the West were generally in a confident and expansive mood back then, and that was one of the reasons why Pope Leo also was able to write that encyclical, uh, Quarto Aviento Seculo de Pres Columbus. Now it's interesting because American wasps could see Columbus as a precursor back then of the Protestant spirit, breaking with the evil narrowness as they thought of it, of the Middle Ages and striking out boldly for a new frontier. He was an entrepreneur, he was a pioneer, he was an American. Catholic immigrants too saw him as a kind of an ancestor who had like them made the difficult Atlantic crossing to a new life, a man brave, bold and determined, but still rooted in the ancient faith. Some sought canonization for him as a saint back then and some still do today. Now, obviously, there could hardly be a, a greater contrast with how he is typically portrayed right now. Most school children, I'm sure many of you have experienced this, have been taught one of two things about Columbus. The first is that he is a genocidal maniac. I think that mostly stems from some highly distorted and ideological material um, that has come out of um, Howard Zinn's book, a People's History of the United States, which has insinuated itself you know, for decades into our educational establishment and has had a huge impact on at least two generations of both teachers and students. And the second phrase, which I think is somewhat related to what Howard Zinn tried to transmit, transmit is that Columbus was worse than Hitler. The American um, uh, Indian movement was the source for that. So which is it? Was Columbus a devil or a saint? It's complicated, but then again, human beings and human history are complicated. And for me, and I think by the end of this, I hope to convince you, I hope also for you, despite his flaws, which in my book, I, by the way, try to present fairly, uh, unlike some of the other texts that, that have come out about him, on balance, I believe Columbus was an amazing and an admirable man. To be looked at with a critical eye and argued about as our perspectives change these days for sure. But in the end, an ancestor, a predecessor who deserves honor and gratitude. Now, whether we will ever return to that as a culture depends on whether we will resolve what I call the crisis of the West. The title of my book is Columbus and the Crisis of the West. Um, which I see as a kind of a cultural suicide. And I don't think crisis is too strong a term actually in this um, context. We'll uh, get to that eventually, but let's start first by clearing away some of the easier things to straighten out. My colleague at the Catholic thing, Brad Miner, uh, entirely on his own initiative this morning, wrote a column on Columbus. 
Columbus, Ohio, that is, which is where he grew up. And he was lamenting the, the cowardice of the mayor who removed a public statue of Columbus because it was, quote unquote, controversial. And the mayor kind of mumbled some things about divisiveness and patriarchy, et cetera. Now, Brad, with just a few cl clicks on Wikipedia, and you can go to the Catholic Thing website and read his column today, which I think is very, very well done. With just a few clicks in Wikipedia, Brad found that in fact, Columbus is described as having perpetrated a genocide against the Tainos, which were the peoples he first encountered in the Caribbean, the Caribbean tribe. But when Brad looked up the Tainos in Wikipedia, the entry showed nothing about genocide. And that's because there wasn't one. So this common phrase, this phrase that came out of Howard Zinn and other left-wing historians, I would simply say that this is a, uh, a historical falsehood that Columbus never uh, intended nor carried out a uh, genocide, which is a horrible thing against anyone. He could be harsh to natives and to Spaniards, but that had its reasons and we'll get to some of that. And just to finish off this preliminary material, Hitler, Hitler killed uh, 40 million, at least 40 million people and did attempt a genocide of 6 million Jews in Europe. Were Columbus and a few Spaniards really in that league? I think not. But to answer no to that question actually raises another question. Why then has this become the common way of thinking about him? Why did those young people, excuse me, I thought this was turned off. I'm very sorry about this. Why do young people, um, mostly white, young, middle-class people, stomp on the toppled statues of Columbus and do so with great moral passion? As sickened as I myself felt when I saw that, I don't blame them. They literally do not know what they do not know about Columbus and they've been indoctrinated into slanders about him as a man and about our whole civilization by teachers who should know better. All this has less to do with actual historical facts about the man and about the, our, our alleged racism, sexism, and homophobia, or, or white privilege, or the other things that are invoked to criticize our culture. All, all of these things have more to do with what we are feeling right now than the actual historical facts. And Columbus has become a convenient symbol on whom we can project what some people dislike about our culture and dislike about its very first appearance on these shores. <clears throat> I often say to people who, who want to blame Columbus and Western civilization and Christianity, because by the way, there is also a, an anti-religious and specifically anti, I believe, anti-Christian element in this as well. I say to people who want to blame uh, all those things for everything that's gone wrong in the past five centuries, are you also going to give Columbus, Western civilization, at least some credit for so much that has gone right as well, expanding freedoms, prosperity, health, food, et cetera, much, much more. That the fact, the fact that this question even has to be raised indicates something very strange about what's going on in our culture. The anti-Columbus hysteria is really in danger of rejecting our civilization root and branch. And when we jettison the Christian and secular roots of our belief that we are all made in the image and likeness of God, that we're created equal, on what basis will we preserve what we say we want to preserve, which is human dignity and freedom for all? I don't make this argument lightly. And let me give you one concrete example of signs that are quite troubling, it appears to me. What does it say, as William Fahey was just talking about here in Boston, that many jurisdictions, my own county in Virginia, are canceling Columbus Day and replacing it with Indigenous Peoples Day? Do the people making the change know anything about Indigenous peoples? Were Indigenous peoples all the same? Are they all to be celebrated? Do they even like one another? Do they treat one another well? The politicization of all of this, as Brad Miner learned in his um, investigation into Columbus, reveals that we know even less about indigenous peoples than we do about Christopher Columbus. 
I personally have no quarrel with celebrating other cultures and peoples if we know what we're celebrating. But there are many troubling facts about indigenous peoples in the New World as well. The Caribs, the Caribs who gave us the name Caribbean, for example, were not only cannibals, and this is documented beyond all dispute, but captured and enslaved so many Taino women. The Taino were the tribe that Columbus was at times allied with, at times uh, in conflict with. They captured so many Taino women that the women, even the Carib women in the tribes used to speak Arawak, which was the Taino language, because they were all sequestered away with one another. And when they spoke with one another, it was just easier to speak another tribe's language. And you want to talk about patriarchy or you want to talk about the, the way that the West has been oppressive toward women and toward other groups, things like these really must be taken into account. And the great empires like the Aztecs, Incas, and others, of course, did such things on a much grander scale, along with perpetrating human sacrifice, slavery and genocide exist among indigenous peoples in both South and North, what we now call South and North America for centuries. I write a lot about native cultures in my book, Columbus and the, the um, Crisis of the West, precisely because I, I found them to be quite interesting as I began to read into them. They were much more interesting than these current sentimental stereotypes about gentle souls living in harmony with nature. In other words, the kind of people that some among us would like to be and project onto them. But even where those qualities do exist among the indigenous peoples, and they do, they, there are things I, I think are, are quite remarkable and worth celebrating about the indigenous. Do we have to replace Columbus Day to do this? This to me, says that there's another spirit at work other than what we're usually told, which is that we're trying to be more inclusive. Is it necessary to exclude one of the principal figures of our own culture, the, the person who really began the, the interaction of old world and new that gave us our culture today? Do we really have to exclude that part of our culture in order to include another part? Now, I think the answer to that question is no, and it, tells us a great deal about what the spirit is behind what's going on. Now, it's often said that Columbus and the Europeans brought slavery, mistreatment, imperialism, colonialism, patriarchy as in Columbus, Ohio, to the new world. That's not quite right, as I've tried to indicate. I mean, they did bring new forms of it and, and not all the Spaniards who came to the new world were exactly sterling characters. They, but we already had in the Americas much of the very thing that many people would denounce about the West today and don't know anything about in terms of indigenous peoples. All of this, I think, should also help us to understand the context in which even the more troubling side of, sides of Columbus um, emerged. He was a very poor governor. There's no question that when he took over in Hispaniola, which is the island that today has both Haiti and the Dominican Republic on it, um, he was not good. He just did not have the kind of political skills you needed to run a system like that. His greatness was an, as an explorer and in his own way as an evangelizer. Now, I'm going to use the old formula about his aims were God, gold, and glory. It's kind of hokey, but it actually does spell out three very large areas of what he was about. He was certainly interested in gold, there's no question. Initially, what he thought he was doing was setting up a kind of a trading post in the New World. He thought he was going to the Indies where there was a, already an established, wealthy, almost mythical culture. And that's what he, he uh, had in the back of his mind when he came into the Caribbean. Later, when it was clear that that was not where he was and that he was not going to be able to do the kind of uh, global trade that he was interested in setting up, he did physically seek gold, but that's only because the other products that were available in the Caribbean were not um, sufficiently interesting to make them worth trading very much. But we have plenty of indications that he was not a greedy man by nature or a violent one either, by the way, unlike many uh, Spaniards who came later and other Europeans. The best witness that we have about this matter of Columbus's nature, what he was like as a human being is Bartolomé de las Casas. He's a Dominican missionary uh, admired by everyone as the defender of the Indians who knew Columbus personally over decades 
And Las Casas was so passionate in his defense of the Indians, he actually went back to Spain and convinced the king and queen to pass laws to protect the indigenous peoples. They weren't very effective over the long distances and given some of the uh, unsavory characters who arrived in the new world. He was also influential in getting Pope uh, Pius III to write an encyclical in 1537, and I'm gonna quote here just two sentences. Indians and all other people who may later be discovered by the Christians are by no means to be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property. And the said Indians and other people should be converted to the faith of Christ, Jesus Christ by preaching the word of God and by the example of good and holy living. That encyclical too, we know was not very effective in stopping some of the abuses, but some important terms have been established that later philosophers and theologians in Spain and also in Rome began to develop. These are actually the places where the, the Western, the, the central Western traditions, the Catholic church and the philosophers in the Catholic church actually started to be to develop international, what we now call international law and, and universal human rights. If you read a history of international law, these things pop up. And we know that the Spaniards stopped their actual explorations to think these things through. It's almost unprecedented in the history of, of human exploration. And later on, of course, British Protestants, mostly um, uh, Quakers and Methodists were able to stop the slave trade. But the, the beginning of that reflection starts actually with Columbus and some of the people he was in contact with. All that by way of background, because we know that when they came to the evaluation of Columbus, um, there's a lot of what I would call exaggeration in Las Casas about Spanish misdeeds, because I think he wanted to make this case so strongly. So when he speaks about Columbus, he talks about his sweetness and benignity of character and nobility of character. And while he allows for his missteps and he says, you know, when he got into trouble, not knowing how to handle the conflicts going on between the Spaniards and the indigenous, he would, he would impose violence because it's the only way he knew how to, how to stop the conflict. Nevertheless, he says, truly, I would not blame the Admiral's intentions for I knew him well and I knew his intentions were good. There's confirmation of this in other historical documents as opposed to what people say about Columbus. We know what Columbus himself said about the situation that he was in. At one point, in fact, when uh, far too many ne'er-do-wells had come over from Spain, he writes a letter back to, uh, to uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. And the details of this letter, I think, are quite interesting. Let me just read a few sentences from it. Our people here are such that it, there is neither good man nor bad who hasn't three Indians to serve him and dogs to hunt for him. And though it were perhaps better not to mention it, women so pretty that one must wonder at it. With the last of these practices, I'm extremely discontented for it seems to me a disservice to God, but I can do nothing about it. Nor the habit of eating meat on Friday and other wicked practices that are not good for Christians. For these reasons, it would be a great advantage to have some devout friars here, rather to reform the faith of us Christians than to give it to the Indians. And I shall never be able to administer just punishments unless 50 or 60 men are sent here from Castile with each fleet. And I send there the same number from among the last and the insubordinate as I do with the present fleet. Such would be the greatest and best punishment and least burdensome to the conscience that I can think of. Now, if you read this, knowing what the circumstances, the difficult circumstances were in the, in the Caribbean and recognize that Columbus is asking the Spaniards themselves to help with Spanish reform and, and then also to, to send some um, competent political figures to help him run the actual island, you understand that his intentions as Las Casas said were good. His ability to carry them out personally or not, but that was a personal failing on his part. I sometimes think that Columbus, his complex personality, and you see it here in, in this passage, is what really lies at the root of his problems as a governor. He was easygoing in one way, and then when that easygoingness kind of led to disorder and people conflicting with one another, then he would become harsher. None of this excuses his period of harshness. 
but he was in hard circumstances and did not have very good political skills. His failures, I believe, were more a, ma a matter of a lack of skill, never a deliberate policy of conquest and subjugation and sheer, sheer cruelty. So, so much for gold, for the, the, the sort of profitable and entrepreneurial side of what Columbus actually did. Let's move on to glory. Along the way, just in terms of maritime history, and by the way, this history is quite fascinating. I, I once was uh, in Rome at, during 1992 when the Vatican had set up a, 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 a replica of the Santa Maria and you walked through, um, you walked out onto the deck of the Santa Maria and it was extraordinary how small that ship actually was, how amazing it was that some very brave sailors could take that small vessel and cross the Atlantic Ocean and arrive back home on it. Just really struck me. But not only did Columbus physically carry out that voyage to the west and then back east, here's what one uh, maritime historian said could also be added to the amazing things that he did, and I'm quoting. His, dis his decoding of the Atlantic wind system Lots of people had tried to sail west, but never came back. You had to know how to sail west and then also eventually be able to get home. His discovery of magnetic variations in the Western Hemisphere. When he got to the Caribbean, his compasses looked off and he just intuited. He was just such a remarkably intuitive nav navigator that he knew that the instruments were being set off by something in the earth itself. His contributions to the mapping of the Atlantic and the New World, his epic crossing of the Caribbean, his demonstration of the continental nature of parts of South and Central America, his aperçu about the imp imperfect sphericity of the globe. The earth, earth actually bulges down near Brazil. And he, he felt it and he accounted for it just by intuition. We did not have modern instruments to help him um, come to that conclusion. His uncanny intuitive skill in navigation, any of these would qualify an explorer for enduring fame. Together, they constitute an unequaled record of achievement. Now, we tend to downplay this in an era of jet planes, but for someone to have done all this with the primitive instruments that he had was already an amazing thing in the history of the world. We ought to add something else to this. There's a reason why another figure like Vasco da Gama, for example, who was a great explorer himself and sailed down the, the Western coast of Africa and eventually did reach the Indies shortly after Columbus had sailed into the Caribbean. There's a reason why da Gama though has never been considered uh, as important a figure as Columbus has been. And that's for a simple reason. He sailed to a land that was already known. You have to understand what the medieval world and the, the ancient world thought there was Europe there was Africa and there was Asia, and they were all interconnected by land. Columbus actually sailed to two continents that had previously been unknown, obviously. And with that, he didn't just unite Europeans and indigenous people. He actually began the, the human sense of us all living together in one, uh, one entire world. I have friends who tell me they were impressed by the first pictures from space that showed the, the globes floating there in the darkness and it made them realize that the human race is all in one globe. But you can make the case that, that that mentality was already beginning to emerge precisely because of what Columbus did in 1492. Well, we're on Catholic premises today and, and we now have some sense of the idea of gold and glory and, and the ways that Columbus carried it out. I want to conclude by looking a bit at the religious dimension of the first voyages. This is a very important motive for Columbus, which tends to be played down by contemporary historians who are themselves not often believers or think that religion is a cover for worldly aims like wealth or subjugation. Columbus believed that he had been inspired by the Holy Spirit to undertake these voyages in order to, to complete uh, and fulfill Jesus' command that the gospel be preached to all nations. Christ's second coming could not happen until the, all the nations of the world had heard the gospel. Now, uh, even, if you, even if you think that is somehow insincere, we have another fact that leads us to believe that his, his religiosity was absolutely sincere. 
we know that in his successive wills, as he was getting near the end of his life, he would always leave a legacy, not a huge legacy, but a legacy from the St. George Bank in Genoa for the liberation of the Holy Land, for the freeing of Jer Jerusalem so that Christian pilgrims could again go and visit the holy sites in the Middle East. Now, you may think that this is not an important thing, but it seems to me that a man who does this, who sets aside money from his own wealth in order to achieve a religious end that will not be achieved till after he's dead, is, has got to be considered serious about his faith. But of even greater historical uh, in, uh, interest is how he conceived it as spiritual mission. We have written records about this, extensive written records, actually. He put together a book called the Libro de las Profecias, a book of prophecies, in which he, he had compiled a bunch of, of quotations and brought them together at the end of his life. And these were sort of a testimony for what he thought he had been doing. And he wrote to, to Ferdinand and Isabella with this description of how he came to undertake this voyage. I'm quoting. During this time, I have searched out and studied all kinds of texts, geographies, histories, chronologies, philosophies, and other subjects. With a hand that could be felt, the Lord opened my mind to the fact that it would be possible to sail to the Indies, and he opened my will to desire to accomplish this project. This was the fire that burned within me when I came to visit your highnesses. Adding that, that he thinks that God wanted there to be a, a amazing miracle in, in carrying this out. He says, for the execution of the journey of the Indies, I was not aided by intelligence, by mathematics or by maps. It was a simple fulfillment of what Isaiah had prophesied. Now, whatever we want to think about this, when he talks about a, a, the God's hand that could be felt, he isn't speaking metaphorically. There are several critical points in his life that he seems to have heard a voice speaking prophetically to him that drove him on to do something that no one else uh, had ever done. And whatever we are to make of this, it isn't necessarily the case that because he thought he was going to the Indies and he did not, a lot of people mock this as if therefore it discredits everything that he did, the, the, the amazing uh, courage and stick to he showed. Nonetheless, he accomplished something that God, he felt God had asked him to do. It isn't the first time that Christians in the history of the world have done something exactly like that. The very apostles in the New Testament are often asked by, to do things by God that they don't entirely understand. And maybe something like that was historically active here with Columbus. And he really achieved something in this religious realm, it's worth remembering. I've mentioned how various jurisdictions are replacing Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. And let's be blunt about this. The large indigenous groups that the Spaniards soon encountered on the mainland, when there were elements of, of those things that, like human sacrifice in the Caribbean as well, um, would give the most hardcore anti-Columbus or anti-Western person pause. That's because it, that would be, a, if you actually want to know something about what this history is. And we have good, evidence about it. The Mexican poet and Nobel laureate Octavio Paz had a fascination with indigenous cultures. He was Mexican. Actually wrote a poem called Piedra del Sol after the, the Aztec calendar, which is sort of a round stone calendar, beautiful poem. And he talks about the, um, these Mesoamerican empires. And this is how he describes them. The religious foundation common to all the Mesoamerican peoples is a basic myth. The gods sacrifice themselves to create the world. The mission of the human being is to preserve the universal life, including his own, feeding the gods with the divine substance, blood. This myth explains the central place of sacrifice, human sacrifice, in Mesoamerican civilizations. Thus, war is not only a political and economic dimension for the city-state, but a religious dimension as well. Besides that, the Mexican novelist Carlos Fuentes, who was no friend to Christianity or to the United States, wrote back in 1992 at the time of the quincentenary, the 500th anniversary, that um, although the missionaries believed that they had the right to convert, 
and accepted that the Spaniards would have to sort of organize the Indians into en encomenderos, they're called sort of um, uh, agricultural com uh, uh, communities in order to be able to convert them. He says that the, the um, nevertheless, we have to recognize the, the shift in native cultures that happened as a result of this Christian influence. And here's the way he describes it. One can only imagine the astonishment of the hundreds and thousands of Indians who asked for baptism as they came to realize that they were being asked to adore a God who sacrificed himself for men instead of, being, of asking men to sacrifice themselves to gods as the Aztec religion demanded. Now this of course does not absolve anyone of things that happened afterwards during the same process, nor does it suggest that the, uh, the, the, the process that Columbus started. Uh, I think what it does suggest is that the process that Columbus started uh, with much less shedding of blood, by the way, is indeed what Leo XIII said. And I think William quoted that he brought Christianity to, and I'm quoting here, a mighty multitude cloaked in miserable darkness, given over to evil rites, and the superstitious worship of vain gods. But let me close with a more uplifting image amid all these, this, this epic clash of cultures that we see. On the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe, which was one of the major influences in the conversion of the Americas, it's a, it was a missionary success that occurred nowhere else in Christianity. But on that famous image on the tilma, where Our Lady is pregnant, there's a, fl a four-petaled flower on her pregnant stomach. Um, the scholars tell us that in the Toltec religious system, that flower represented the highest of all the gods, the god beyond all the gods, the absolute god who is beyond uh, all, all contact with human beings. And so in that Toltecan theology, that God who was so powerful and so transcendent that he was absolutely inaccessible could never be in contact with human beings on the face of the earth. But the fact that that four petaled flower uh, appeared on the, the stomach of the Virgin Mary indicated to indigenous peoples that that great true God had come down to the earth and was in Mary's womb. He had now come close to them. So I'll conclude, indigenous or European, we have to recognize that as, as a quite important thing among many other things that have come down to us because of Columbus's voyage, that there is that religious revolution that occurred on these shores. And so I will argue that we should be grateful for the imperfect vessel who made that and many other wonderful things possible on these shores, Christopher Columbus. Thank you. Thank you very much, Robert, for that um, eloquent and informative talk. And thank you also for accepting to be our first chair St. John Henry Newman Chair of Catholic Studies here at Thomas More College. Uh, Robert is teaching undergraduates and he is also providing wonderful opportunities like this for us to extend our mission into other media and the public forum. So thank you again, Robert. I highly recommend that you purchase Dr. Royal's book, Columbus and the Crisis of the West published by our friends at Sophia Institute Press. Sophia Institute, marvelous Catholic provider of not only books, but catechetical materials, films, online resources, um, Catholic classics and new works. I highly recommend you visit their website and I can't recommend this book more. Coming up next for our viewers is Christopher Check. Now, I, we have roughly almost 2,000 people who have registered and are watching, and I know many people have questions. So before um, Dr. Check comes on, let me just say that we will have questions at the end, uh, and we will have to be selective with such a large crowd on the questions. Now, Dr. Dr. Check, whom I'm proud to call Dr. Check because um, he is a recipient of a doctorate from Thomas More College, He's a very close friend and he's an authority on the talk he is about to give, which is on 
Christopher Columbus and the Evangelization of the New World. He's an authority because he's the president of Catholic Answers, the largest global institution providing through many different media, authentic, clear, straightforward answers to Catholics and non-Catholics about the authentic teaching of the Catholic Church. I'm also very um, proud, and I, I like to make a point of saying this since I'm the son of a US Marine Corps officer, to point out that Christopher Check is also a Marine. He was an officer, an artillery officer, and he served this country in um, Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm in Kuwait and Iraq. Prior to becoming the president of Catholic Answers, uh, Christopher Check was the executive vice president of the Rockford Institute. And many of you probably know him for, from the absolutely marvelous seminars uh, that he ran through the Rockford Institute. I've always thought it's, it's been a loss to the country that those haven't continued in some way, shape or form. But at least this afternoon's conference provides a little taste of what um, Christopher Check provides every day on uh, the radio, through the Catholic Answers blogs and talking all over the country. So I'm very proud to have Christopher Check as our next speaker. Some may know him from some of his books. One of the most inspiring books, uh, audio books and, and lectures that you can possibly hear, perhaps some of you listened to this past week and that's uh, Christopher Check's talk on the Battle of Lepanto. If you don't know about the Battle of Lepanto, or if you do, and you want an absolutely riveting hour, hour and a half, you have to get Christopher Check's rendition of Lepanto and his explanation, both of, of Chesterton's magnificent poem, but of the significance of that battle for our civilization. But now we move away from material battles, more deeply into spiritual battles. Christopher Check on Columbus and evangelization. Thank you, Dr. Fahey, uh, and, and, and good morning. It's morning here in the land of Junipero Serra. Um, thank you to Dr. Royal. First rate, uh, I, 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 I want to say I actually got Robert Royal's book back when I was in the Marine Corps when it originally came out, 1492 and all that, and I do have the updated and expanded version, and I, I, I second William's recommendation of it. And thank you to the Thomas More College of Liberal Arts for including me on this program with uh, a, a, some real scholars. Uh, if I may, a thought before my regularly scheduled thoughts. Uh, we're living, my friends, in a contentious age. Some are saying uh, historically unprecedented. That sounds uh, redundant to me. And in any case, we're not yet beheading Carmelite nuns and live streaming it over Zoom, so Deo gratias. But nonetheless, the public quarrel is aggressive and destructive and brutal. Destructive, uh, by my count, uh, more than 30 statues of Christopher Columbus have been toppled by mobs or taken down under cover of night by municipal authorities. In my mind, there's little difference. In fact, there's a kind of honesty that attaches to the enraged mob in broad daylight. Still, I'm left wondering if all of this aggressiveness and destructiveness and brutality might have been dialed back just a little bit if we were not headed towards an election that is in itself so contentious. You think, right? I can hear so many of you saying, well, yes, surely the management of the pestilence from China or the reaction to the cruelty of a small number of policemen would not have presented in, in, in quite so ugly and terrible a way as it has if we were at a different moment in the election cycle. Instead, we have this moment when it seems that most of human experience is colored somehow by this election. And this, this makes sense in America where we have contra King David's advice, put a lot of trust in princes. 
But as someone who works in a Catholic apostolate, I'm unsettled, especially by how much the quality of our faith is measured on the scale of this election, the kind of comments that come into the building here at Catholic Answers uh, that overtake social media and the blogosphere and the questions that come to us. And here, by the way, I'm not talking about the guidance that, that we give informing right consciences before people head to the voting booth, right? Or, or mail in their ballot, as the case may be. I mean, that, that, that members of the faithful uh, are now regarded as good Catholics or bad Catholics uh, based on a really limited litmus test of uh, which candidate they back. And by the way, on, on, on both sides. And in this angry and myopic time, uh, very good Catholics, you know, want to know what they can do. And my response, I apologize, it's, it's, it sounds a little bit flip, but I, I like to say, well, Catholicism is a religion of being, not doing. And like I say, it sounds a little flip, but it happens to be true. That said, here is something that you can do. You can send your children to the Thomas More College of Liberal Arts. It will be good for them and it will be good for the culture. And the reason for this is, is, is straightforward. And it, I assure you, goes to my remarks. I can count on one, maybe two hands, the number of presidents of colleges in this country who know what education is. And William Fay is one of them. And here it is. Let's go straight to Pius XI. Because education consists essentially in preparing man for what he must be. There is no perfect education, which is not Christian education. In other words, my friends, unless education is Christ-centered, unless it begins with the incarnation, it's incomplete. And it is, in fact, through the lens of the incarnation and only through it that we get a complete understanding of the Columbus story. So now to that, but, but one thing more, uh, I'll add that the Christian education at the Thomas More College of Liberal Arts delivers a, an especially robust young man or woman, all full of battle joy for the fight. Okay, now the incarnation and Columbus. The first 14 verses of the Gospel of John are known as the last gospel. In any case, they're known as the last gospel to regular attendees of the traditional Latin mass, right? And its removal from the liturgical reforms is most regrettable. And by the way, this is not a little offhand swipe at, 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 the, at the Novus Ordo. It was removed at first in 1965. So thank goodness we used the 1962 Missal. Um, but I call this scripture passage to your attention because the story goes that Christopher Columbus was in the habit each evening of standing at the prow of Santa Maria and proclaiming aloud the last gospel. So let's imagine, as Dr. Royal said, really a second rate uh, sea tossed carrick or caravel, right? Or now, maybe 60 feet stem to stern. The afternoon watch is being relieved by the evening watch, so it's about seven o'clock. And there is the man soon to earn the title Admiral of the Ocean Sea, standing taller than his crew, a vigorous man of tall stature with a blonde beard and hair, clear complexion and blue eyes, as his son Fernando tells it. And now he slows a bit to drive home the words, at verum, at verbum caro factum s. And the word was made flesh. And we can imagine the crew of Santa Maria genuflecting at these words. And now we can imagine them afterwards chanting the Salve Regina. Now, it is, it's no accident of history that the gospel is born to the new world aboard a vessel named for the spiritual vessel, the vessel of honor, the singular vessel of devotion, as we say in the litany of Loretto, and to Our Lady's role in the evangelization, we will come, the evangelization of the new world. But first, et verbum caro factum est, and the word was made flesh. 
It's no accident of history that Christopher Columbus chose to read every day the passage of the gospel that reminds us of the central fact of history, the incarnation, for it is within the context of the incarnation that human history makes sense. What do I mean? I mean that many of you heard me say this, all history before the incarnation points toward it and all history after the incarnation comes out of it. And this is something Christians should understand and be proud of. Let me try to illustrate what I'm arguing here with examples from the ancient world. By the way, this idea is not original with me. Alexander the Great, fourth century BC, his conquest of the East results in what we call what? Hellenization, right? And as a consequence of that Hellenization, the Greek language and Greek thought, which are inextricably linked, right? You have to have the vocabulary, the vocabulary and the syntax and the rhetoric, right? And the grammar all there to give you the way to express this Greek thought. Absent this, the mystic John the Evangelist would not have this expression that he chose to convey to us as best he could the mystery of the second person of the Blessed Trinity, Logos, right? And the people of the East to whom the gospel was first preached would not have had the ears to hear it. A century later, the Punic Wars, right? That contest between this little republic on the Tiber and this vast commercial empire, Carthage, where they really did get together regularly and throw babies into the furnace, right? Well, it was this contest, the Punic Wars, that would decide control of the Mediterranean world and the world in which the incarnation would take place. And the church is aware of this and she takes pains to remind us of this every Christmas Eve at midnight in the new rite and at prime, right, in the old rite, but by the way, restored to the new rite by Pope St. John Paul II, this passage from the Roman martyrology that locates the incarnation in human history and identifies it as the singular moment of human history that it is, right? Around the thousandth year since David was anointed king in the 65th week of the prophecy of Daniel, but also, my friends, in secular history, in the 194th Olympiad in the year 752 since the foundation of the city of Rome in the 42nd year of Caesar Octavian, of the reign of Caesar Octavian Augustus, the whole world being at peace. So when you hear those words at midnight mass, or in prime, right, in the old rites, what is that peace? That's the peace that is the consequence of these Punic Wars. And then the effect, the Roman Empire providing, and now we're coming out from the incarnation, the Roman Empire providing the framework of the church, this, this, this mix of the Hebrew scriptures, of Greek thought, of Roman political order, Christianized, baptized, if you will, in the Middle Ages, and the, and, the, and the sum of these parts we call Christendom. And it is this Christendom that is brought to the new world in 1492. That is the meaning of the Columbus event, the Columbian event, as historians like to call it. Christendom brought to the war new world. Alas, people who should know better don't seem to. And this underscores my point about university presidents. You doubtless heard two years ago, not quite two years ago, 20 January, the distinguished president of a distinguished Catholic institution of higher learning announced that he would be shrouding a series of murals that have graced the halls of that university's main building for 135 years. The university, of course, is Notre Dame, highest ranked Catholic university in the country, if US News and World Report is to be believed. 
the same magazine that rates hospitals and insurance companies, right? The murals depict scenes from the discovery of the new world by Christopher Columbus, right? Discovery, new world, these are no longer expressions that we use common when I was in grade school. Now we say encounter of two worlds, right? The artist was a Bolognese, a man named Luigi Gregori. He painted most of the interior, uh, decorated most of the interior of the church at Notre Dame as well. But Father Jenkins sent a letter explaining why he was taking down these murals. And here's the money quote. For the native peoples of this new land, and he puts new in italics, however, Columbus's arrival was nothing short of a catastrophe. Whatever else Columbus's arrival brought for these people, it led to exploitation, expropriation of land, repression of vibrant cultures, enslavement, and new diseases causing epidemics that killed millions. The mural's depiction of Columbus as a beneficent explorer in front of the native peoples hides from view. The darker side of this story aside, we must acknowledge whatever else we'll come to that whatever else now contrast father jenkins with leo the 13th as william and robert have mentioned quarto abiunte seculo his encyclical on the quadricentennial here's another passage by his toil columbus's another world emerged from the unsearched bosom of the ocean Hundreds of thousands of mortals have, from a state of blindness, been raised to the common level of the human race, reclaimed from savagery to gentleness and humanity, and greatest of all, by the acquisition of those blessings of which Jesus Christ is the author, they have been recalled from the destruction, from destruction to eternal life. So, my friends, when Father Jenkins says, whatever else... Columbus brought. Well, here it is. This is the whatever else. It's Christendom brought to the new world. It's baptism. It's salvation. Now, my friends, it is common now, it is popular to call this day, no longer Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day. And in fact, as Dr. Royal observed, if we really wanted to celebrate an Indigenous Peoples Day, well, then wouldn't we look for an event in their calendar, in their own calendar, not the day in which, according to the narrative, the evil white European male came and ruined it all. But in fact, this is the great day in the calendar of all the Indigenous peoples of this hemisphere. Why? Because it, is the, because it is the day that salvation, that Christendom, that baptism lands on these shores. Now, my friends, is this cultural superiority? Well, I turn to no one other than the most broad-minded of pontiffs, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who wrote in his apostolic letter, Scripture Sacre Effectus on the 1600th anniversary of the death of St. Jerome. This wonderful little letter has been overshadowed by a considerably longer encyclical issued a few days later. But the Holy Father writes, it is difficult for a young person to understand how the quest of religious truth can be a passionate adventure that unites heart and mind. How the thirst for God has inflamed great minds throughout the centuries up to the present time. Columbus's mind included. How growth in the spiritual life has influenced theologians, philosophers, artists, artists poets, historians, scientists, explorers. One of the problems we face today, not only in religion, is illiteracy. The hermeneutic skills that make us credible interpreters and translators of our own cultural tradition are in short supply. I would like to pose a challenge to young people in particular. Begin exploring your heritage. Christianity makes you heirs of an unsurpassed cultural patrimony of which you 
must take ownership. Be passionate about this history, which is yours. Dare to fix your gaze on the young Jerome who liked the merchant in Jesus's parable, sold all that he had in order to buy the pearl of great price. Pope Francis, this is the pearl of great price. The faith brought here to the new world by Christopher Columbus in 1492. I'll close with this. Another suggestion about what you can do. Get in the habit of praying the Angelus every day. We do it here at Catholic Answers every day at 12 o'clock over the intercom. It will remind you, it will interrupt your day, right? The incarnation was an interruption. It will interrupt your day and it will remind you of the central fact of the incarnation. And here's another suggestion of what someone can do, one person in particular, bring the last gospel back to the liturgy. It's removal from the mass, maybe one of the worst aspects of the liturgical reforms. If we want Catholics to love this Christian patrimony in a complete way, we need to be reminded every day of the incarnation. And as Dr. Royal observed so beautifully, Our Lady in this, in this singular apparition and the manifestation left to us, right? In the image on the tilba, the only apparition in which our lady appears pregnant. We're given this constant reminder of the incarnation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher Check, for that robust and interesting talk. And thank you to all our friends at Catholic Answers who are also acting as a sponsor of today's conference. And again, I highly encourage everyone to sign up on the Catholic Answers website to regularly receive their offers and information. And if you ever have any questions, about the authentic teachings of the Catholic Church, turn to Catholic Answers. Um, Some of the answers are written by Mr. Check himself, but you can send in questions if you can't find anything on their own site and you will get a response. Another one of our sponsors is the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. One of the finest organizations for academics, both scholars, teachers, but especially undergraduates in the United States. The Intercollegiate Studies Institute was established in 1953, and their mission, as they currently express it, is inspiring college students to discover, embrace, and advance the principles and virtues that make America free and prosperous. If you are an undergraduate, I highly encourage you to sign up for the free journal published by um, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute to become aware of their conferences throughout the United States and their speakers that they will send um, free of charge to your colleges and universities. I first met our next speaker, Bill McClay, through the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. In fact, Bill and I were together um, participating in a conference that my wife was running. And we traveled throughout Yellowstone and uh, Montana. And those of you who've seen any photograph of Wilfred McClay will understand my distraction during these travels with him. I felt the entire time like I was in the presence of Theodore Roosevelt. Bill McClay is just a stupendous writer. He's an eloquent and virtuous gentleman. He's a scholar scholar. I highly recommend that you look into his books They are a fascinating range. He has an excellent introduction to US history that's written for undergraduates who are just beginning their studies. And on the other end of the spectrum, he has one of the finest studies of the 19th century of the intellectual traditions of the 19th century called The Masterless. Most recently, Bill has published a book, which I'm, I'm ashamed I do not currently own. It came out just last year. It's gotten all sorts of attention and awards. It's entitled Land of Hope, 
an invitation to the great American story. And it's Dr. McClay's attempt at providing a beautifully written, accessible general history of the United States that in a scholarly and even-handed way gives back to students a narrative that's thoughtful and critical, but also will lead to a kind of admiration for the goodness that can be found in the United States and that is rather singular in American history. And so I have, am familiar with Dr. McClay's other books and so I don't, I don't have a, di any difficulty saying, I highly recommend that you purchase a copy of Bill McClay's new, new book, Land of Hope. I have, I'm looking forward to reading it, hopefully over the Christmas holiday. And I am absolutely sure it's a wonderful read. Most recently, it um, won the Pellucci Prize for Best Book of the Year. Um, and I know you can find that book on the Encounter Books website. It was published by Encounter Books, as um, was Dr. McClay's earlier book on place, on a sense of the importance of place in American history and politics. So now we'll have uh, Dr. McClay, and as he's popping up, I will simply say to the viewers, Dr. McClay's schedule is very tight this afternoon, and so I'm going to let him speak. Uh, he may not be available for this afternoon's panel. I hope he is, but we will have the panel almost immediately after his talk. Bill, good to see you. Good to see you. Can, can you hear me and see me? Everybody, I, I hear a loud chorus of yay. So. Uh, I, I'm uh, not going to talk as much about Columbus as the other two speakers, partly out of deference to them and their greater knowledge. But I do want to talk about Columbus as the kind of symbol that he's become, uh, a symbol for those who wish to destroy him and who have made him the focus of evil in the, uh, the early modern and modern world. Uh, he represents for them a desire, a deep desire, obsession even, to reckon with the, the Western past that is seen falsely as an uninterrupted parade of guilt and shame and sin uh, without any reference to the violence and brutality of the, of the indigenous peoples uh, in, into which the European explorers came and Columbus specifically without any interest in Columbus's exploits, in his personal qualities, which Bob Royal has, has uh, touched on, his exploits, his bravery, his uh, extraordinary seamanship, uh, his uh, uh, faith, uh, the depth of his faith, which again, Bob has uh, helped to illustrate. Um, it's an, a horribly unbalanced, one-sided, one-dimensional world picture and by the way, before I go any further, I too want to hold up Bob's book, oh, which is reversed on my screen, but but it's a wonderful book. The Sophia Institute people have done a great job with it, and I can't recommend it highly enough. It's also, Bob is a wonderful writer uh, and, uh, and captures some of the subtleties that I'm also going to try to get at in my, my words. Um, so if we're to understand this uh, obsession, this uh, desire, uh, that is, uh, at least in some quarters of our society, so, uh, so much uh, in the ascendant. We need to understand the sources of this guilt and shame and, uh, and the need to offload it onto figures like Columbus. It's a serious pathology. It won't yield to taunting or derision, and it won't yield to reason much either, but we can try. Uh, they resemble, I think, purification rituals of some kind, although I think one has to allow for different motives and the degree to which you know, credulous people are being exploited by others who have a, a more, um, uh, more explicit, if not uh, more rational, if not explicit agenda. Um, but so we leave that aside, but uh, um, it's, there are those who I think you have to take seriously that for them, this is an issue that is one that goes very deep. It's a question of working out their salvation with fear and trembling. And uh, that's why it's so hard to reason with it. The, the thing that all parties on that side agree about, although I think is, that, is on the loss 
of any kind of sustaining relationship to the past. The past <clears throat> is a uh, is a cesspool. The past has no heroes. The past has nothing to teach us. It has no heroes because there's no one pure enough to stand uh, as an object of our admiration. Of course, the problem is that there is in time, in history, there's no Archimedean point that we can use to stand on and, and, and to take ourselves outside of, of the circumstances of history. We're all, to use a word of the day, we're all complicit. Um, if you want a purified past, the only way to get it is to have no past at all, which is, among other things, a futile project. Um, no one wishes himself or herself into being. Uh, uh, without any, <laughs> without the experience of, uh, of gestation, without a mother, without uh, the, the whole mammalian uh, biology with which we've been uh, created, and uh, and so on and so forth, we come into the world dependent and uh, and and uh, in some ways indebted uh, for our very being to others. Um, but one way. That uh, to to certify or warrant one's innocence, if that's the the moral passion that's at work here, is to project guilt onto others, to accuse and tear down those who whom you believe you have historical and moral warrant to to tear down, to say these are th people who are not worthy of our admiration. Um, Christianity ha has a way of dealing with that pathology imperfectly because we are imperfect beings, but the doctrine um, explains the fact that we are flawed beings, explains our flawed nature, or offers an account of it, whether explains is the right word, I don't know, but and offers us a means of understanding and expiating for our perversities and our malfeasances, our misdeeds. Um, it has a robust doctrine of forgiveness and charity, a love that rises above the desire to mete out vengeance and, and collect on all debts. You know, the word for sin being uh, in many languages uh, very closely related to the word for debt. Um, the steady recession of Christian sentiment in our culture cuts it off from this possible source of moral renewal and balance. And Bob Royal makes a wonderful point, in which he just did in passing, but um, that the notion of our equality, which of course all the social justice uh, uh, mantras proceed from that, from that assumption that we all are, are equal in some respect and have equivalent dignity. Um, the only respect in which that's, that's arguably true is in the eyes of God. In every other respect, we are, we are not equal, we're not interchangeable. Uh, so if you dispense with the notion of God, which you dispense with, uh, you know, the Christian, the Judeo-Christian understanding of God, then um, where are you? Where, do, where, is, where is your passion ground for equality, for equity uh, grounded? Um, the pulling down of statues is, a, I think, a form of symbolic murder. I argued this in a column for First Things. Um, and it's very similar to the silencing of dissenting opinion that's so much a feature of academic life and even to some extent public life. Uh, uh, and in my own field of history, the past I think is often regarded as uh, nothing more than a malleable background for the concerns of the present and not as an independent source of wisdom or insight or perspective, which of course the Christian understanding of history is so we are profoundly indebted for uh, the, the deepest insights on uh, a, a recovery and a connection, a vital connection with the past. Uh, and the past is the only thing that really can teach us, not the present. Um, so those who are caught up in this moral frenzy ought to think twice about jettisoning figures of the past who don't measure up perfectly. Um, uh, for one thing, the scriptures say, well, the measure we give is the measure we receive. Um, and those who have an, in, an inflexible and unforgiving standard can expect the same treatment. Um, 
it's also part of what it means to be a civilized person, to believe in the passing down of all human achievements that are partial, uh, because all human achievement is partial. There's no perfect human achievement completely untainted by, by base motives or uh, by uh, antecedents that can't be controlled. Uh, and to cherish it no less for its partiality, to seek to perfect it and, and pass it along and, and carry it. And I think figures like Jefferson, who is very much uh, an object of scorn du jour, has been for a while, um, it's a good example of that. Someone who offered a principle um, that uh, has had enormous and positive effects all over the world. Uh, in uh, the, the preamble of the Declaration of Independence uh, um, is it, it, a kind of lodestar for us. Um, uh, he's imperfect in other respects by our lights. Uh, but part of what it means to be a civilization is this ongoing collective project, the aimed at the ennoblement of the world. Lincoln has become a target. They're pulling down Lincoln statues. They're even going after Frederick Douglass, uh, which is mind numbing to me. Um, the 1619 project, uh, which has been mentioned, uh, uh, doesn't mention Frederick Douglass or Martin Luther King. I wonder why. I mean, these are two of the greatest uh, African-American leaders and, 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 and battlers for the cause of freedom and equality. Um, there's a complete absence in the uh, statue destroying uh, mood. Uh, there's a complete absence of charity toward the past. It's willing to exercise the historical imagination and ask, what does it feel like to walk in another person's shoes? What did it feel like or look like? What did the world look like? The range of possibilities open to a man like Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass for that matter. Um, and uh, uh, what moral enormities of our own time you know, are I, am I willing to tolerate um, that, and that for future generations will rage against me and cancel me in scorn for tolerating, you know, the institution of abortion, uh, the warehousing of the elderly, and any number of other shameful things that we do uh, that are really part and parcel, of, unfortunately, of our way of life. So uh, what I, 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 I want to try to wrap this up quickly so we can have time for questions, but let, I, I want to float an idea here that in some way what we're really, what we failed in uh, is a kind of civic education. I, I agree with both of the speakers before me that ultimately uh, a grounding in the Christian faith is it's the only way to get a full education. It's the only way to find our way to uh, a, a solid grounding of our ideas of liberty and, and, uh, and responsibility. But uh, civic education is a good place to start since we are, uh, we are a mixed and, and uh, uh, poly, poly, polytheistic, polyglot society. Um, uh, and a civic education, I think, has a much larger meaning than we've ever assigned to it, to, because, because to be, uh, a citizen is uh, it should be regarded as a, a a very noble calling, particularly in American culture, in American democratic culture. That that it is to be um, uh, a citizen is to be not a subject. That was very important to those in the revolutionary generation. That distinction. More than that, it is to be to get us. A, a, a true civic education that gives one a sense of citizenship is to have this sense of felt connection to the past, to those who had gone before, those who established the admirable things uh, in the culture for which we are or should be grateful. Um, so it's an initiation, not only into a canon of ideas, you heard that talk about America is an idea. Well, yes, it is. And it's more than that. It's it's a kind of community and not just a community of the present, but a community of memory, to use a sociological term, a long human chain. You think of Burke and Chesterton here, long human chain linking past, present and future in shared recognition and gratitude. Um, 
so patriotic education is a kind of education in love, which of course is a very hard thing to teach. Um, but we do ourselves no favors and our young people no favors if we fail to honor the magnificent achievements of our history and leave them out of accounting almost entirely, as, as has become too often the case. We need to remember that one of the chief functions of the instruction of the young in history, it's a civic one, uh, we, we want to make that education a, an entree into shared memory, imparting a sense of membership and belonging uh, through a sense of living connection with the past. Uh, great speakers have uh, a knack for this kind of thing. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address is a wonderful example in the midst of the nation's greatest crisis. He reaches back to 1776 as one of the great achievements in human history and say, you know, it's up to us now uh, to redeem the promise of that, that beginning uh, and, uh, and, and not to falter, uh, to honor the dead and honor them by continuing the cause they so nobly advanced. So uh, that ability to reach back to the past, to get courage, encouragement for the future is something uh, that we need, is something our, our children need and deserve. Um, uh, I think of the admonition in Philippians 8 about you know, whatever is true and beautiful and admirable and noble and so on. Think on these things. This is a kind of theory of education, which I imagine is, is exactly what's done at Thomas More uh, and uh, particularly under Bill Fahey. So um, uh, it's, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's what our young people deserve and consider for a moment, wrapping up here, the alternative. If a great story of estimable things can give us courage and hope, what is a great story of uh, the, the in, I'll call it the inglorious story, because that's what the Howard Zinn version of American history is, an inglorious story um, in which somehow the bad guys always make out in the end. Um, we're so solicitous of the, what we call safety of our students, not to hear certain words spoken or certain positions advocated uh, and debated. Um, <clears throat> well, what about the inglorious story? Doesn't that have an effect on their, their safety, their sense of, in, in the sense of their psychological well-being, their sense of what life's prospects are, what, what it might hold for them? Uh, uh, shouldn't we take that into account? Uh, yeah, the, uh, one statistic, I have a long list of them here, but I'm just going to give you this one statistic. Suicides among Americans aged 10 to 24 increased by more than 50%, 50% between 2007 and 2017. That's 10 years. Um, <clears throat> there are you know, others I could cite. A lot of very bad statistics about the, the general outlook of the young uh, and, and the attendant uh, behavioral indi indications, drug use, uh, death from drug drug abuse, alcoholism, and so on. Um, it the morale of a nation is a question of its spirit more than its material well-being. And this, uh, the, what I call the inglorious story, has moved into the vacuum that's been left by the the decline of the older story, the decline of traditional religion. Uh, and the decay of family life, all the things that we're all too familiar with. Um, and uh, we need to recover that sense of our story. Um, one of the great things about Bob Royal's book is that he is very, very, very scrupulous about recording the faults, the failings, the malignancies, the, 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 the real uh, dark side of some of our heroes. Uh, and, uh, and that's a, perhaps a change, maybe not as much as people say from the older version of the great American story. But uh, we have to have that. We have to be honest about our failings, but we also have to be honest about our successes and honest about 
the way in which Justice Columbus's uh, excursion to the New World was not an excursion into Eden. Um, we compare remarkably well to any civilization in human history for all of our faults. And uh, the West is, uh, has been the bringer of human good, along with some very bad things, including the secularization that now is threatening to eat, it, eat us alive. So I uh, advocate for a more robust version of civic education that it seeks to impart a sense of our continuity with our past, uh, with generations that have gone before, and begins the process of restoring a sense of meaning to our collective life. You know, Viktor Frankl, the great Austrian uh, psychiatrist, uh, said, you know, that those who have a why to live can bear with almost any how. But um, he might have added, those who do not have a why to live are, are never going to find a how sufficient to take its place. So that's what we need, I think, to restore in our collective or civic life. And Columbus is a good place to start. Thank you, Dr. McClay, very much for that talk. Dr. Wilfred McClay is um, the GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in Liberty at the University of Oklahoma. And again, his most recent book, which is being issued this year with supplements, both for students and teachers, and is also being put into an edition for younger students. So not only adults and college age students could benefit from this book, but there's a, a very handy version being created for younger students as well. The title of that book is Land of Hope, you can, of course, go to Amazon to purchase it, or better yet, you could go directly to Encounter Books and purchase the book directly from them. Um, thanks again, Bill. Thank you. Um, I'll ask the technical angels to bring everyone back on for a few minutes. I know we're coming up on the official end of the conference time, but we'll, we'll violate a few rules and continue a little bit longer. Dr. McClay may have to nod out, yeah, I... um, bow out, excuse me because of other engagements and I wish uh, promises. I could off. <laughs> so um, are you gonna be here for a moment, Bill? Yes, yes. Okay, I have some of the questions and I'm, I'm gonna shuffle them around. So those of you who've been watching, if, if it seems like I've jumped over your question, um, it's because I wanna throw one at Dr. McClay. This one came in and it seemed like a good one for you. It has to do with your comment on um, purifying the past and the controversies currently about monuments. And the question goes like this, doesn't every healthy living organism occasionally shed parts of itself for the sake of renewal? Monuments serve a purpose for those who establish them. They serve a purpose in time, but often that purpose changes. And isn't it, isn't it acceptable to replace monuments, move monuments to a different location, or even change your mind as a culture and destroy a monument or publicly say, we, we don't approve of this individual. Absolutely, uh, but that decision should not be made by a handful of people who, who have uh, um, uh, arrogated unto themselves the right to decide for everyone else that we are democracy and, uh, we, uh, and we, we ought to dis decide these things in a, in a democratic way and in a deliberative way. You know, uh, uh, if, if you follow these things over a long period of time, historical figures have um, their ups and downs. Well, again, Bob Royal kind of has illustrated the, the uh, you know, how Columbus was a Protestant, a Protestant hero. Uh, how many people remember that? Uh, there, there, there's, and we should be, uh, have a sense of, of modesty about uh, whether or not on uh, cultural questions we are living in the age of ultimate truths where we, we now can decide forever and anon what's, what's, what's going to be done with these monuments. But that said, I completely agree with the, the, the question. We have to, it just is individual memory. We can't remember everything. Um, it's much as you know, historians, we like, to, we like to have good memories, but uh, 
But the problem is if you remember everything, you don't have a principle of selection. You know, the a logos, you know, legain, the, the verb, it means to select. Um, and when creating an, a, 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 one of the meanings of logos is, a, is an account of something. And uh, to create a coherent account of the past, you need to be selective. And, and that selection changes because the past changes as we, as we move into different times and have different perspectives on that past. So I'm, I'm, I'm with the questioner, you know, uh, almost entirely on that. I just, it's a question of who does it and how and when and in what manner. William, can I just say that there's a statue of Giordano Bruno in the Campo de Fiori and that should come yes. down right away. Let's take that down right now. Yeah. And by the way, all those bridges that are named for uh, people who waged war against the papal states all over Rome, we should change the names of those bridges immediately. <laughs> well, I, you know, I can top. Well, I don't. Bruno's pretty good, but I, but if you've ever been to the opera in Rome, there is way above the stage. There's a the medallion uh, high above the stage that uh, expresses gratitude to Mussolini. <laughs> uh, for the construction of this this, this teatro, and uh, uh, I always thought, I, I, when I first saw that, I my my first reaction was to be shocked, and then my second reaction was to admire Rome for having the capacity <laughs> to, um, you know, there are no, there I don't think there's a Via Mussolini anywhere. There there are, you know, Gramsci and others, uh, Karl Marx, uh, streets named after them, but. Uh, but to preserve that, you know, that, that, uh, that's my idea of a civilization. <laughs> <laughs> this, here's a question, and I'm not sure who should take this. It's, it's related. Um, someone wrote in, and, and by the way, those of you watching, if you send in questions to center at thomasmorecollege.edu, they should pop up on my screen. Um, here's the question. Uh, Someone wrote, and they're from Colorado, and they say that Colorado uh, recently replaced Columbus Day with Mother Cabrini Day. Obviously, this is clever, but at least it still leaves the day open for honoring an Italian and a Catholic immigrant and the contribution of that uh, community's culture to the United States. And they simply ask commentary. I'll, I'll pick that one up, William. It's like Bill, I don't mind um, a certain amount of historical readjustment, you know, as we go along. But I want to know why Mother Cabrini and why not Columbus? Because a lot of what's going on is driven by immediate political passions. Obviously, the statues, when they're torn down, are not a matter of civic discussion. Uh, or orderly, you know, rule of law kind of uh, approaches to these things. There, this, this is this is a disorder and a riot. Is basically what it is. And even when it comes to the deliberation, I want the deliberation to be not only about what is politically expedient right now. I want the deliberation to be based on truth. Historical truth is always complicated. We know that individual human beings are complicated. St. Paul says, you know, I see the good and I do the good I don't want to do. I mean, we're all, that's part of who, of all of who we are. But we don't see anything like that reflection. So, look, to me, it sounds like, and I'm, I'm just saying this from a distance, I've actually visited that shrine outside of Denver, by the way. It's pretty impressive up there. But it sounds to me like it is just a political move. We're replacing a woman who's an Italian-American, a very sweet, holy woman, uh, established all sorts of educational institutions throughout the, the Americas. But, you know, is this really history or are we, what we are, what we are doing, you know, playing to some kind of political theater right now? And that worries me. It, it, worry me, it worries me enormously. In, in my town, we had signs put up for Black Lives Matter. No one knows how they got up there. No one knows whether the town council was involved with it. They're just up there. And then they just, they, they just disappear. And, and I think that this usurpation of public space by just random political passions is something to be resisted and to thought, be thought about calmly. So, you know, the particular case could be good, but 
where the, the overall phenomenon is, is um, a, a pathology. It's a fever, it's a fevered city as somebody wants, a city with a fever as someone once said. I think that was Plato, wasn't it? Yeah, the Republic. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by the way, that there is a city that Glaucon wanted <laughs> a fever city. Yeah. There, there is, by the way, a Mother Cabrini Day, and it's November thirteenth. Well, yeah, this is what I was saying earlier that there is this cancel culture that's taking place even in these public spaces. That you can also honor other things, but there's because Columbus has now become so central to this dispute about. We don't even know what, you know, the, the other races, indigenous peoples, Black Lives Matter. We don't even really know what is it actually being pro uh, protested because we don't know about him. What we're doing is projected something the way Bill was talking about. He's become a kind of a, you know, a, a scapegoat for, for many other things that we don't like about our society. But the, the cancellation is really aimed at going back to the point at which the Western and Christian heritage on these shores makes its first appearance. And so this is an extremely radical attempt to, skew, to if not cancel and, and, and uh, root out, to really skew now the way we're gonna look at our history. And that's why I'm skeptical that these changes that we're gonna make right now are gonna be good ones. I think we need, we need more deliberation. Our kids don't learn any history. They, they, if they know that Columbus sailed the ocean blue in 1492, I'd even be surprised about that day. So um, look, we're, we're a, a, a living dynamic country and we can of course change and, and move ahead. But I'm, I, don't like, I don't like movements of inclusion that exclude or the movements of affirmation that negate. That seems to me to be something that, that uh, is unique at this particular moment. In 1992, I gave a lecture on Columbus, basically the same kind of material I just spoke about, um, at Princeton University. There were 150 people there. Some people pushed back on certain points, others made points of their own. We had a civil discussion. I walked out of there unmolested and we all went home. It was an academic evening. Can you imagine what would happen if Princeton University invited me to give a lecture about Columbus and the crisis of the West, or even just you know, the history of 1492. The, the world has moved on to a place, as Bill was saying earlier, where we can't even have these discussions. So I want to slow down with this. I, I want us to calm down and slow down, learn a bit, get, get, engage ourselves more fully as human beings and as a nation. Because right now what we're doing is, you know, it's the rocket's red glare. There's just, we're just firing at one another. And I don't think that this is the way that a great, democratic nation ought to look at its past or conduct itself toward the future. I have two um, questions on Isabella of Spain. So I'm just going to put them together. Uh, one of them comes from uh, Granada, a viewer in Granada, Spain, who's very happy that we're uh, hosting this conference. And he's simply wondering if any of the speakers would be able to comment on the role of the of the crown in evangelization, and in particular, Isabella of Spain and her relationship to Columbus. And then a second question from the United States, someone uh, wrote in and said, my daughter uh, has said to me, um, Christopher Columbus must surely have been an awful man because he took slaves back to Queen Isabella. So it's a broad topic on perhaps clarifying the role something of the personality of Isabella, but also the specific uh, issue of, of slavery has come up with a number of viewers, wondering how to respond to it. Well, I can speak to the slavery question. Um, I, I think I can say categorically that Columbus has really no, little to no interest in slavery, that when, when he enslaves people, it's because things are either out of hand or uh, there, were, there were two justifications in Spanish law for enslaving a person. One, they were captured during warfare. So they're a prisoner of war and the alternative is either to kill them because you're not gonna have large stockades of prisoners of war or to make them into servants. Now, I wanna make that distinction too. To say that they were slaves is not necessarily the same thing as to say that they were chattel slaves, the way that Africans were made um, 
the property of their masters in um, the American South, for example. Now, the other reason that in, in Spanish law you could enslave somebody is if they were viol the gross violations of the natural law, cannibalism, human sacrifice, if you couldn't stop them any other way. So it was all, the only of those two things. And that, that was made very clear to the, the, um, the Spaniards. You know, they, did they observe it? No, of course they didn't observe it. Columbus did take uh, people who had been, been enslaved back to Spain. Some of them he brought back with him after the first voyage in particular, he brought some of them back with him to, to act as interpreters in the, in, in the New World. But yes, this is a problem. And you know, it's true that slavery was a universal institution. It existed in the New World before he got here. As, as I was saying, the, the Caribs enslaved Taino women just you know, right there. It was a universal institution that took a long time to stamp out and it was mostly under um, Christian auspices that it eventually was stamped out. But it is a problem. He was in a very difficult circumstance. The, the way he restrained these people, he also sent Spaniards back in chains to, uh, to Spain. So it's not, it's not a clean cut situation. I think we have to say he shouldn't have done that, but this is where Las Casas says he was kind of ignorant of the natural, of natural and divine law even though his intentions were well, were, were good intentions. I know less about Isabella, I'm sorry. Maybe somebody else does. So, William, I would just say uh, there are a number of really fine books on Isabella, William Thomas Walsh and Warren Carroll wrote a, lo a lovely book as well. Um, Garrett Mattingly, not a Catholic, uh, but the man who wrote an excellent popular history of the Armada also wrote a wonderful biography of Isabella. And I, I recommend that one as well. Um, and, and, and Dr. Royal can correct me on the slavery question, but I feel fairly confident saying that Isabella and her husband were both opposed to slavery and made this clear in their correspondence. But as yes, far as the, as, as far as the, um, as far as the relationship between Columbus and Isabella, it is an interesting thing because of course, Columbus is the son of a weaver. Um, he's not born into the noble class, but when he uh, arrives in Portugal after uh, you know, this event at sea where the ship founders after they're attacked by Fr the French uh, warships. And then he has to swim six miles with the help floating on an oar or a sweep, uh, makes it to Portugal and meets a, a woman in the Portuguese nobility uh, at church. Uh, he's a devout man, as Robert pointed out. Um, so he finds his way into the conversation of the European nobility. He get, doesn't get anywhere with King John, who is the, I think that's his name, of the King of Portugal at the time. But he does eventually find an audience with uh, Ferdinand and Isabella. And Isabella is a holy woman. And at this time, um, and, and uh, Robert mentioned uh, this, the um, uh, Col Columbus's writings, th th there are these uh, kind of qualities of locution at parts in them. And he has a he ha he has a, a confident sense of his role as a principal figure in a providential plan. There's in no question of this. And in fact, it, he was right, you know, but he 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 convinces Isabella of this. And I think that it's her own piety that makes her able to hear what he is saying. And then also, I would say that the times were such that in, in the imaginations of Christians, the message that Columbus was uh, giving to the queen, when this succeeds, uh, Spain will have a lot of money to go and free the Holy Land for this crusade. And, uh, and, and as we're approaching the year, uh, um, as we're approaching the year 1500, there is an eschatological sense that I think is common in the minds of, of European Christians. So, the money's coming from this expedition. We're going to free the Holy Land, the second coming of our Lord. It all seems to be fitting together. And I think Isabella was very taken with this argument. William, if I can just put in one more point about slavery. Um, 
Look, the same arguments are being made now about George Washington and uh, Thomas Jefferson, who actually owned slaves. And it's thought that because they owned slaves, and they were very uneasy about this. I mean, after all, Jefferson, I think, as Bill was alluding to, is the guy who gives us the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal, endowed by the creator with, with their rights. So we don't honor Jefferson and Washington because they were slave owners. In spite of that, they were great men. And in fact, what they gave us was something that enabled us to overcome the very common practice of slavery at the time. I would, I would say that the, the case against Columbus is less. He's not, look, he's not a slave trader. He's not interested in setting up a, a lucrative business in, in slavery. I feel after a, a lot of years of, of looking at these documents, that he kind of gets forced into this when at the moments when he doesn't know what else to do and he's gonna export Spaniards and export uh, 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 the natives. But that's really no, not part of his heart. He, that's not what he's after. He's an explorer. He thinks he's evangelizing. He's trying to open up new lands for the, uh, for, for the uh, Sp Spanish crown. And we don't have to have, as, as we've all been saying, you don't have to have a perfect human being on all counts to ad admire them for the great things that they achieved. He did what no one else had ever done before. He created this one world, as I like to, say, to, to, to put it. We, were, we finally found out we were all in one world. Look, there used to be this debate in 1992 about what to call the anniversary. What, what is it an anniversary of? Did Europe discover America? Well, that seemed to be unbalanced to some um, Native Americans. So the, the term that was used in Spanish was el encuentro, the encounter between the two cultures. And look, in a way that helps, it helps serve, serve a certain purpose. But it is true that the Americas did not know the rest of the world. The rest of the world did not know the Americas. As I was saying in the medieval view, you, the land masses were all connected, they thought, and then they discovered that there were these other two continents that, and, we forget that this opened up the rest of the world to the Americas as well. It also brought diseases that killed large numbers of people, but that would have happened if the Chinese Wuhan virus had come across the Pacific with, with Chinese explorers. There were no Chinese explorers, by the way, but if there were, and they had landed in Peru or someplace, the same thing would have happened. Millions of Native Americans died from these diseases. So it's, you know, history has got it's always these darks and it's dark and light things, but I think on balance, we've got to say that Columbus is certainly not Cortez, who is a mixed figure, and even more so, he is not Pizarro, who's a pretty bizarre character. I mean, he was a bloodthirsty, greedy man. Columbus was not that, and we know that not only from what we see him do, but what other people said about him. We may have to um, have the center sponsor a debate on Cortez, <laughs> just from the movement of eyebrows, when the name was mentioned. Um, I'm going to take a little bit more time and limit, limit it to maybe two more questions, if the two of you are still able to stay. Dr. McClay did have to leave. We thank him. Hopefully, he will be watching the uh, questions afterwards. All of these talks will be up on the Thomas More College Center website so that they can be viewed later. So if you have a friend who didn't get a chance to see this, you, you'll want to encourage them to, to come back and watch. So uh, two more questions. One is um, someone who's writing a very personal question, asking for some advice and how to engage people. And the other one is historical. I'll take the personal one first. They write, um, I grew up on a Lakota reservation. I am not Indian but I have many, many close friends who are. They genuinely feel traumatized by the history of European and American expansion and the general treatment of the um, indigenous peoples in North America. How do I regard the past accurately, but respond and engage my friends both intellectually and charitably? Uh William, I would recommend that the that that this gentleman or or lady, I don't know, um, look into the life of Father Desmet, uh, who was a great friend of the Plains Indians, and in fact, in addition to bringing them baptism, uh, acted 
as a, uh, a an advocate for them against the predations of the government of the United States. The Dismet story, I don't know as well as a similar one, however, that takes place in Wisconsin uh, with Father Samuel Mazzucchelli, uh, an Italian Dominican who uh, Car Cardinal Burke, when he built his beautiful uh, shrine to Our Lady in, in La Crosse, put a little altar to Samuel Mazzucchelli in the crypt. And Mazzucchelli also was uh, a, a defender of the Wisconsin Indians or Native Americans uh, against the predations of the uh, of the United States government and also the exploitations of Protestant um, missionaries. So I would look into the lives of these two men, uh, Desmet and Matsukeli, for a perspective on you know what the church was doing uh, with respect to uh, the, the 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 people of, of the, the the natives of the um, of the Upper Midwest. Any thoughts, Robert? Yeah, I mean, I, look, there's there's no denying that Native American groups in many places just simply were badly mistreated by Christian governments who should have done better. There's, we just say that straight out. But we're dealing again with human history and human history is a complex. You mentioned the, the Lakota. I have a episode in my book, you know, President Trump was at um, Mount Rushmore just this past uh, 4th of July. And there was a big controversy over how Mount Rushmore had these presidents who were slave owners. The Mount Rushmore itself had previously belonged to the Lakota Sioux who had been driven out of there by the US army. So I started to dig into this just because I was curious about that history. I, I do a lot of reading into Native American history in my book, as you well know. And it's strange that the Black Mountains there were owned, were occupied by the, the Kiowa. The Lakota came in after being driven, I think, out of Minnesota, what we call Minnesota now, and wiped out the Kiowa, committed genocide against the Kiowa, and took possession of the Black Hills. Then the, the uh, American army comes in and wipes, basically wipes out the Lakota and drives them into reservations. These are the kind of things that happen in history. They're horrifying. Um, we wish that they didn't happen. If it's a stain on the history of the United States that these things happen. But for a Christian, we, li we live in a, a fallen world. And all we can do is look at what even our own best um, representatives, maybe not best, but at least representatives have done in the past. And by learning from what they did, try never to do it again. I, I think that you can express great sympathy, but also look at just historically how these things um, happen. And that, that's one of the wheels in history that we've got to just prevent from going on and on and on. We cannot have that kind of, um, cultural imperialism and then military imperialism toward any people. That has just simply got to be ruled out in the future. And we learn about that by looking at the history. William, if I could give a little footnote here on the on the term genocide, I'm very grateful to Dr. Royal. In, in his book, he quotes an, uh, an historian, and by the way, not someone that we would necessarily describe as a conservative uh, at all, uh, Stafford Poole. He's actually a Jesuit priest. I'm not sure he's if he's still alive or not. He used to teach up at the seminary up in Orange County. Um, and his history of um, the, the, the Our Lady of Guadalupe and, it, and it's sort of the cultural history of it. I think he's a bit of a skeptic, but it's still it's still valuable. Anyway, he makes the point and it's quoted in, in Robert's book. He said, you know, the use of this term genocide to uh, uh, it, it, it applied to Columbus actually cheapens the word uh, when we refer to Armenians or Jews, where there is, or or and he doesn't say this, but I would add, like or or the the citizens of the Vendée, where there is a deliberate effort to wipe out a people because of their religious beliefs or their ethnicity. To be sure, and I would be interested in in Robert's sense of the accounts. We don't have. You know, there aren't demographers in the new world, so we don't really know how many people lived here. Uh, 
and I think anthropologists have made some good guesses at it, but it, it may in fact be that millions were wiped out by diseases to which they had no immunities. I don't know if it's the numbers are as high as that, but I'm uh, uh, perfectly content to believe it. But it's not genocide. It's, it's not the deliberate wiping out uh, of a uh, uh, of a particular people for their ethnicity or for their religious beliefs. For the um, the last question, I'll give a I'll give a little bit of a preamble. The question is not mine; it came in from someone else, but it is a question that I've wondered about myself. So here I am, the president of Thomas More College. What on earth does Thomas More have to do with Christopher Columbus? Uh, in fact, uh, quite a bit, and I mean personally the man, Thomas More. If you look at the utopia, the opening of the utopia, when Moore is describing being in Antwerp, one of his friends introduces him to a seafarer who has visited lands in the New World. And Moore had a personal knowledge and interest in the New World. His own father had placed Thomas in the household of Cardinal Morton, who was effectively the Secretary of State under Henry VII. And Morton and Henry VII bankrolled the Cabot expeditions in search of the New World. And, and John Cabot, also an Italian, even though we remember him under an anglicized name, was a, was a rival to Christopher Columbus in the, in the sort of race to find what was beyond what everyone else could see and what were the lands that mariners and fishermen talked about but no one had charted. And Columbus hits Hispaniola, but he actually doesn't hit the mainland first. It's John Cabot who hits the mainland, somewhere between mid the middle of Maine and Newfoundland. He discovers continental North America. And someone wrote in and, and has asked, what about the Vikings uh, for whom we have historical evidence and, and potential other early explorers? Why does Christopher Columbus charge the imagination, why does he get credit? Why do we have monuments to Columbus rather than John Cabot or others who came also with missionary zeal uh, to the new world? Um, a, a couple of thoughts, and then I'm, I'm interested what Robert will say. Um, it, it, it is interesting to, to uh, you know, bring up the t Tudor England um, one of Columbus's brothers, I think Bartolomeo, actually does have an audience or a, or a, or a hearing with uh, Henry VII uh, in an effort to raise money uh, for the expedition. He's unsuccessful, obviously. Um, and then also, William, um, Columbus does land on a continent in, on his third voyage. He, he arrives in Venezuela. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, yeah. So uh, and then and then his fourth voyage is to explore it in greater depth. So he does locate a continent now, whether or not he dies thinking he's landed in India or not, I guess we'll have to speculate. Um, but I mean, the reality is that the whatchamacallit rune stone, notwithstanding <laughs> in um, Minnesota or whatever, there's no record of any exchange. I mean, it, 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 it is as Robert has been saying all day. This is the permanent uniting of two worlds previously isolated from and previously unknown to each other. The permanent uniting that doesn't happen in the wake of uh, whatever uh, Bjarni Haraldson or I'm, I'm God bless them. Anybody who tried this in the open sea is a hero in my book, but there's just no record of of exchange. Robert, any thoughts? Why? Why Columbus? Why do we not have? Statues, yeah, you know, I, of John Cabot or Leif Erikson being pulled down. Well, Chris has, has has stated probably the most important part of it. But look, in history, it's a funny thing the way imaginations get moved. Um, I mentioned how Vasco da Gama actually reached reached the Indies shortly after Columbus sailed the first time. It it just didn't change things. You, you can't quite tell why a whole mentality changes at, at a certain point. I, you know, I could almost make the counter argument, why are we in America and not in Colombia? It's because another Italian, Amerigo Vespucci, happens to be on these voyages. He sends back these dispatches 
these texts and maps get into the intellectual bloodstream of Europe. And for some reason, for some reason, now it's America rather than Colombia. You know, it could have easily, just as easily been Colombia, right? I think it was um, Simon Bolivar who once said, I mean, you know, he, he's the liberator of Latin America. He, he was gonna found a, a specific country, he said, that was gonna be named after Columbus with the capital Las Casas after Bartolome Las Casas, the great defender of the Indians. And he said, thereby we Latin Americans will show people that we know what is greatness and what is goodness. And uh, Colombia has been founded. Its capital is not Las Casas, unfortunately. But there, there, there are these funny ways in which you know we now sometimes call them memes, but but these these um, waves get going in intellectual life. And I think you also just have to say physically what he did made those voyages possible. You know, by the second voyage, the maritime historians say by the second voyage, I, I think it may be the third, but I think it's the second. He had found the idea to this day, the ideal route where you take the westerly winds on the southern route and you take the prevailing winds and the northern route back to Europe. So the, this great intuition that he had made it possible for for that flow to take place with a relative security. It was never entirely easy to cross the Atlantic, given obvious things, but he did something that, that sparked a, a change that the human race kind of, did, it intuits these things. Um, whether rightly or wrongly, it intuited that this had really changed the face of the earth and it did. Marvelous. Well, Thomas More College of Liberal Arts was established to provide a solid education in the liberal arts, a Catholic education for students of all faiths, united in the quest for what is true, good, and beautiful. And it pursues that by seeking wisdom and sharing it joyfully with the world. That's our mission statement. All of you, roughly 2,000 people, have been able to participate in that mission thanks to our extraordinary speakers, Dr. Wilfred McClay, Dr. Christopher Check and Dr. Robert Royal. I would like to personally thank all three of them, as well as our um, sponsors that have supported this event, Sophia Institute Press, Catholic Answers, and the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. If you came in late, you want to listen again, take some notes, everything will be up on the Center for the Restoration of Christian Culture website within a few days, I think, our our tech experts will have it up there for you. So you can come back and listen, watch, recommend it to friends. The college uh, is able to pursue and sustain these events by generous donations. So if you've enjoyed this, um, please feel free to send a check and suggestions for other events. No gift is too small or too large. And I will also say this, should there be any mayors watching, uh, a catalyst for this conference was a conversation that Christopher Check and I had when we were both appalled at the statues coming down early in the summer. And I very much wanted to try to rescue a statue or two. Um, we would honor it here at Thomas More College. So if you're a mayor or on a um, board of selectmen and you want to get rid of your icon to Western civilization, please contact me and we'll be very happy to establish it here at Thomas More College in Merrimack, New Hampshire. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And again, Chris, Robert, thank you very much. Bill, you're not here, but thank you anyway. Uh, this was a real delight. Good afternoon thank you, and happy Columbus thank you. Day. Amen.